Hello and welcome to our seminar Production of High Performance Cement at Lowest Cost Enabled by Latest Analytical Technology. My name is Frank Portala and I'd like to guide you through today's seminar which will take about 60 minutes. Within the seminar we will show you the Buka solutions for the cement industry and there having a closer look into the applications of XRF. And from there we will switch over to the lab where we show you our automation solutions. Back in the studio, we will highlight the applications of XRD and then switching back again to the lab to another live from the lab session where we highlight our benchtop XRF solutions. And then at the end of the seminar, you have the possibility to ask questions to our experts, which then will be answered. Today's speakers are from the XRF product management, Adrian Fiege and Kai Behrens, and Rainer Schmidt, who is our market manager for the application solutions. And then when we are switching to the laboratory sessions, Renata Janic, who is our application specialist in the XRF application team. And with this, I would like already to switch over to Adrian and Kai. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Frank, for the introduction and also a warm welcome from our side. Yeah, welcome from my side as well. Yeah. So now we would like to take a closer look uh, into the production of high-performance cements and uh, how we can accomplish this task uh, at a very low cost and how XRF can support you here to achieve your goals. So Adrian, um, the most important thing are analytical requirements in modern cement uh, production. Can you tell us a little bit more here? Yeah, so there are of course multiple aspects that you have to look into uh, when choosing the right equipment. So of course at the beginning you need to look into precision of the analysis and accuracy. This is especially important for quality control but also process monitoring. Then depending on where you use the system, you're also looking into the speed of the samples throughput. In a lot of cases, you need to have a result in a couple of minutes. Some cases, you have more time. And, and this is what we will cover today uh, quite a bit, is you want analytical flexibility. So you also want to be prepared for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and, and a lot of those uh, things are really related to, to the direct analysis, but a lot of things are around your, your work to make it really excellent, right? Like the GLP com compliance. Exactly, exactly. So maybe to get started, for those who are not completely familiar with XRF, I would li also like to spend a few minutes on, on uh, the technology itself, just very briefly. So what we are doing here, Kai, is we are actually having an X-ray tube that excites the sample. We're exciting the inner shell electrons, which helps us a lot because we are not so much reliant on the, the bonding, so the next uh, neighboring uh, atom. And then when we excite the sample, we have um, outer um, electrons which fall back into the vacancy, and this emits, emits uh, fluorescence X-rays, and these are characteristic for the atom that was excited, so therefore we can then have an idea about the elemental concentrations in the sample. Mm -hmm. So very briefly explained okay. here. Yeah. And so this is, as I understand, basically the, uh, the, the reason why XRF can directly work with solid samples. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it's the ideal tool for uh, cement production because all our materials we want to analyze are solid. So this shortens the, the sample preparation time down to a minimum and also eases, so we don't need a lot of chemicals, right? Exactly, so you just need to grind the sample and press it typically and, and that's about it and you get the result. And it's also non-destructive, so you essentially can keep the samples and reevaluate if in case something uh, is not as expected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are different technologies here, so mostly in the cement industry we are talking about wavelength dispersive, so WDXRF. Here, just very briefly explaining, we have the tube, a relatively powerful tube, up to four kilowatt. We have a sample, and then as the heart of the instrument, we have the goniometer. So the goniometer uses analyzer crystals, as um, indicated here, to separate the incoming photons, so the fluorescence photons, uh, based on their wavelength. Mm -hmm. And so this is basically the reason why in wavelength dispersive XRF, I'm typically achieving 
higher performance because every single element is analyzed with the best settings. So where other technologies are always take a, a kind of compromise settings between a range of elements. Exactly. So here this allows you to get a very good signal to noise ratio and therefore also a short measurement time. So in the cement uh, industry, we are basically, here we have just picked a little bit the production process. So we are using um, XRF, but also XRD, which we will cover later today, but then also combustion analysis in multiple stages. Mm -hmm. So we start, for instance, at the, the mines where we are doing grade control and quality control of the material. This could be your limestone, but also iron ore. And then once we receive the materials and they are getting mixed, uh, we are looking into the raw materials at the cement production site. So this is the first time you will see our equipment there. So you will see the XRF there for elemental concentration and XRD for um, phase analysis and quantification. So basically three uh, analytical uh, methods would give you the complete overview of the production process. Yeah. And I mean, just having a brief look at this slide, you can see that XRF and XRD in particular uh, all over the place. So you need it all along in, at the raw mill, at the cyclones, you're using XRF sometimes to extract the hot meal. Later you measure the clinkers with, with all these three technologies and in the storage again then comes uh, XRD, very important, so sort of for um, shelf lifetime or some hydration so to see whether your, your material is still in good shape. And then obviously, especially the more versatile XRF devices are also used by central labs to make sure that we have the right qualities up on receival of the different cement products. Yeah. So uh, looking now into the XRF applications in the cement production, we typically do the grade control in, in uh, mining and uh, the mineral beneficiation process. So when we are working with limestone, dolomite, sands, then of course elemental uh, concentrations are vital. And the second step is then to control the raw mix or the raw materials and, 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 and really to get a good understanding about the raw meal and, uh, and uh, uh, com composition, right? And last but not least, uh, whenever we are going then into the process to, uh, to analyze the hot meal. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the next step then is uh, the final uh, product from the kiln process, the clinker. And there it's uh, be, uh, uh, important also to understand the secondary fuels. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we are uh, uh, exchanging primary fuels like gas and oil uh, by, by solid uh, secondary fuels. Uh, could be rubbers, which would uh, have a bigger impact uh, in zinc and related to that cadmium, but also fuels or polymers with their, their fillers. And so it's important to understand uh, what are we bringing in uh, with the alternative fuel and what would be the consequences for the clinker. And then going, going uh, further down the road, almost the final, uh, final product, the quality control of the milled cement, and then uh, basically the, the final cement products uh, before storage or when we ship the, uh, the, the product. And this could be uh, pretty, pretty vital when we think about tunneling cement. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and there it's important that we know exactly the right composition. Yeah. So there's also more tasks that can be done by XRF, and this goes then more in the environmental tasks. And this is what I meant about uh, flexibility of the devices. So Kai mentioned it already. Well, in the alternative fuels, for instance, we are looking into some heavy metals. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, we are also looking into all kinds of disposal slurries, uh, remaining metals, filter material that we can, that goes into the waste and we might have to analyze for its uh, toxicness uh, to make sure uh, it's, we're not paying too much for this discarding. So overall speaking, in, in, in XRF, we are covering, of course, the, the key elements, the key mm -hmm. eight elements uh, listed here from sodium up to, of course, calcium, aluminum, and so on but also all other elements that are uh, relevant at some plants and then trace elements, which we will show you uh, later throughout this uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's get started with, with a few examples uh, in, in mining. Mm -hmm. So uh, some application examples here. So first of all, uh, it all starts with the limestone. Uh, this is basically the material we get out of the quarry. 
And of course, they, this has influenced the, the, the hardness. Silicon dioxide is important. Uh, whenever we think about the later appearance of uh, our construction, the color is important. Manganese iron will have an influence. And of course, some hazardous elements could be also playing a role here, like uh, chromium, or when we have lead sulfide, uh, which are pretty common in limestone quarries. Um, here, basically, we can start with an energy dispersive XRF, and, and our instrument, S2 Puma, uh, has a very nice precision. Um, so, t talking about something like five to seven minutes measurement time, uh, or a small benchtop wavelength dispersive instrument like our S6 Jaguar uh, is good enough uh, and achieve nice precision within five minutes. And the difference between the bo uh, both methods or instruments is that the wavelength dispersive is better for the very light element when we look into fluorine or for sodium and uh, very low magnesium. And um, yeah, we start with the rocks and after the crushing and milling, we basically look into pressed powder pellets, mm -hmm. which we are analyzing in, in those two instruments. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's have a brief look at, at some data that we uh, collected here on our benchtop WD XRF systems for the S6 Jaguar. And like Kai mentioned, uh, um, you would pick the Jaguar over an energy dispersive systems, mainly with the lighter elements, but also when you want to re have really nice precision and accuracy uh, for um, ele color giving elements like uh, iron or manganese. And as you can see here uh, on the left hand side of the slide where Kai stands, so this is, uh, we really get a, get a high precision here and very close to the certified value for these critical elements. And what is another thing that is very important, uh, and this comes, is actually true for all uh, analytical equipment uh, in the cement industry and also like at the mining industry that we need long term stability. And this is here depicted a little bit uh, for sodium as an example and for iron. So really over, over the course of a, a couple of days, you have a very high stability for uh, the measurement of iron mm -hmm. and all other constituents in the limestone with the S6 Jaguar. So and this makes really happy customers, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, so this is one of the customer testimonials using the S6 Jaguar. Um, and he said basically the S6 Jaguar is his important uh, tool for the uh, uh, process lab. So it's, it's a nice backup uh, for the big instruments, brings in the same technology like uh, the, the operators know from the big instrument. And it runs all the ROM examples. Mm -hmm. So basically it also takes some uh, an excess of samples during the day. And, and it's a pretty good alternative backup for SA Tiger, uh, especially for the grinding plant. And, and so he is a pretty happy customer since years now. Mm -hmm. So when you want to get a bit further and really need to uh, look into all kinds of trace elements, this could be at a mining site, but this can also be all throughout the, mi uh, the, the production of a, of a cement. So in your raw materials, maybe uh, in after the, the clinker production, or maybe also later in, in the final cement. So then we can also offer a very nice uh, solution, uh, the out-of-the-box solution. So this is our GeoQuant traces, which really covers all the different trace elements that are relevant here. So over 50 elements, and of course also measuring the major elements here. And so this is really a nice feature. Of course, then you're talking about uh, a high-end uh, floor standing device. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the uh, additional intensity coming from the high X-ray power up to four kilowatt really helps to detect the traces. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I want to highlight here one fact, uh, means basically uh, Bruker can um, yeah, deliver the, the pure instrument uh, and, and our users can calibrate the instrument on, uh, by, by themselves. Uh, there is software included. Nevertheless, we also offer a range of solutions around the geological uh, application path, but also about uh, around cement. And actually, the, the instrument comes pre-calibrated uh, to the site. So all those quant packages like GeoQuant traces are uh, consisting out of uh, an, uh, a calibration, uh, drift correction samples, and QC samples. And um, also, the, the, the methods are inside covering already in, uh, the knowledge of, of uh, centuries of experience analyzing industrial related materials. So enabling a quick startup here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. 
So maybe as a next example, we can look into uh, some what, what can be done at the raw material side. Um, so here, um, we are then often also took it, looking into, into some versatile instruments, oftentimes wavelengths, dispersive systems. And we just covered a few words about the, our geoquant traces. But of course, we have also other solutions like the geoquant basic for the major and minor mm -hmm. elements in all kind of geological samples, which are essentially ending up in, in your uh, cement product or the cement quant, which we'll cover a bit later, and the petrol plant. Mm -hmm. So talking about uh, geoquant basic here very, very briefly, so this is a, a solution that enables you to cover the 11 major elements. It is a solution that comes with based on certified reference materials, including materials that are highly relevant, of course, for the cement industry, like cement itself, limestone, dolomite. Maybe worth to emphasize here, there's a few speed uh, calibration, so you would also prepare your samples at few speed, but of course you can use it to indirectly reference your, your samples and create a, a pressed pellet calibration. So the nice thing is here, 11 samples really done in, in um, seven to eight minutes um, with a few speed calibration here. Mm -hmm. And as we can see here, Kai, um, even with such an out-of-the-box versatile solution, you can get a very high precision and accuracy. Just as an example here for sodium, uh, we really nail it, and we have a relative standard deviation of just 0.5%, and also for aluminum, really close to the certified value, and yeah, just extraordinary relatively standard deviation. Yeah. The pretty good thing here is uh, that uh, those solutions are based on international certified reference material. So basically by, by adding uh, Geoquant Basic to your, your instrument, you already have the reporting about uh, GLP compliant traceable uh, and, and, uh, calibrations. And so you can uh, and trust your values and show to the auditor in the uh, quality control audit uh, the data means. And this you can do on a regular basis and you can see there is a pretty uh, small relative standard deviation uh, be below 0.5% typically, and, and this really helps you to earn in your workflow. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So why is this the case? So how do we deal actually with our instruments also with long-term stability? I mean, I always hear that when you have an X-ray tube, well, it loses intensity, and then uh, you, you need to adjust frequently. How do mm -hmm. we deal with this at Bruker? Yeah. The first thing uh, when comparing XRF to other technologies is uh, you recognize that you typically do a calibration once when you, when you set up the instrument or sometimes on a yearly basis when, when your uh, regime in the lab requires this. The one thing is, of course, uh, the, the, the stability of the instrument, which is crucial for the, the uh, reporting of good values. Of course, you can catch uh, those uh, losses on intensity or changes on the instrument performance by drift correction. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, the more stable the instrument overall is, uh, the less frequent you need to run the drift correction sample. And, and here is an example. About 12,000 hours, we monitor the rhodium L intensity, which is giving an indication about the, the detector the crystal, but uh, mainly the X-ray tube performance. And we see that we have a loss of less than 0.0.2% on intensity over one year, mm -hmm. which is almost world record. And this is not just the tube, but it's also crystals and detectors. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons why the, the SA Tiger is recognized as the most stable and best uh, instrument, especially for process control. Yeah, this is really impressive. So. Um, maybe, Kai, let's look into another part on the, um, along the production process, so now at the cyclone and uh, rotary kiln, so what we can do there. Um, maybe first give everybody here a little bit of an overview of, of our equipment. Yeah, yeah. so um, uh, in most cement plants you would find the... Uh, <laughs> would find the SA Tiger, it's a sequential wavelength dispersive instrument. So. That's basically the workhorse, and, and it's very flexible. Uh, it has a goniometer and uh, from one, three, and four kilowatt X-ray power. The instrument in the middle is basically uh, the S8 line. That's a multi-channel instrument. 
So for each element, it has a particular uh, channel, so consisting of an uh, analyzer, crystal, and a detector. And so this instrument is very fast, um, uh, but therefore bound to a specific application. We see those kind of instruments in big integrated cement plants with two kilns and, and a high sample uh, throughput. And then we talk about uh, the smaller systems, uh, the S2 Puma energy dispersive and the S6 Jaguar wavelength dispersive XOF. And they act as a very good backup. Uh, they can be used as the main instrument for smaller uh, plants like grinding plants or when you, when you have uh, uh, receiving stations like in a harbor where you are receiving a clinker from abroad and you basically want to have kind of importation control. Uh, uh, control. Mm -hmm. And so those are the ranges of instruments we would see in the cement industry. Yeah. Maybe one thing here to highlight, as you can see uh, on Kai's side for the bench top equipment, you can see that they are also equipped with an XY auto changer, so that is really unique with, with Bruker um, for, for benchtop equipment. And it also just a, a little bit of a sneak preview here. It also means that we can put these into automatic automated environments. So we have a full integration possibility here even with benchtop systems. Yeah, now so let, let's maybe jump uh, to, mm -hmm. to another topic here. So we uh, also, when, when, uh, when we um, advertise this uh, uh, online seminar, a big topic nowadays in the cement production is how can we reduce the uh, CO2 emission and get to a net zero uh, CO2 emission along the production process into construction. So a lot of thought is put into this, and we all know that, for instance, a big contribution comes from the limestone, limestone simply by uh, definition. It's a carbonate, so you're releasing the CO2 up on, up on heating. So there are multiple ways to reduce the carbon emission here. And the midterm goal of this industry is really to get to a zero, uh, net zero emission by uh, 2015. And this is a really um, tough goal, but possible, seriously. So here's really where XRF uh, also can support. Mm -hmm. And then the one thing is uh, the limestone. Uh, of course, the other thing is uh, when we talk about the energy, uh, and, and uh, this is uh, an, an actual uh, scenario that energy cost has gone up dramatically. And so we are, on the one hand, uh, need to replace fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is mainly okay. done, as we said, with, with alternative fuels. So, and in both uh, uh, cases, XRF is vital uh, to help with the alternative raw materials, mm -hmm. but also to help with the alternative fuels, right? Exactly, and this is something I want to look a little closer into, so the alternative fuels. Um, so you have different options here. So pet coke and coal as the more obvious, um, and coal especially as a fossil mm -hmm. fuel, but then you can, of course, look into tires, uh, um, waste oil, uh, plastic, and especially also others like, like wood, recycled wood is, is an important part. And here we can see what is the CO2 emission uh, per energy received. And their pet coke and coal is pretty high up, but then also tires, uh, which is already a used material and plastic is not, is not too bad here in terms of yeah. the uh, per kilogram uh, energy being produced. Mm -hmm. Means uh, the interesting thing here is basically that uh, we we everything with uh, with the burning values of a few calories we typically find in cement plants. Uh, means I've seen old banknotes which are burned uh, and, uh, as disposal uh, jelly bears uh, which are overdue. So uh, everything which which burns basically can act, but it will have an influence on the final cement quality as soon as we are having additional elements in there. So exactly, so as you can see here, it's a very, really wide range, and it of course it depends on the accessibility, also on the costs, but we can of course imagine that uh, waste oil is, is, is cheaper than, than pet coke, or animal waste might be also a good resource, because otherwise it's dumped, and then mm -hmm. waste wood. But all these uh, waste materials are of course containing other in constituents which are either polluting the environment or ending up in your uh, cement. So there we really need to take a closer look. And uh, one point here is, uh, for instance, the zinc concentration in, in tires, which is really high. So this is something then you need to 
monitor, but also sulfur that can come from, from, your, from your material might mm -hmm. contaminate yeah. your, your processes. Yeah. Means uh, the the zinc uh, is is kind of interesting because actually when you are mining zinc uh, you typically have a little bit of cadmium uh, coming with it, and actually on the one hand uh, you are not so concerned about the zinc in in the cement it's it's bound and fixed. The problem is uh, suddenly you are seeing cadmium coming up and you are wondering and and those concentration levels are. Uh, pretty low in the PPM range, uh, which are then suddenly uh, becoming a problem. So, as we said, uh, the, the SA Tiger would be an instrument to monitor this. Yeah. But Kai, so compared to our cement, which is a quite pure product, we are dealing here with very different challenging materials for XIF mm -hmm. as well. So what would be there maybe our solution? How would we uh, come across that we are dealing with sort of heterogeneous materials with a lot of different trace elements in there. What is, what is uh, your thought here? Yeah, the, the, the biggest problem uh, is actually you are receiving a truckload of waste oil. And uh, suddenly, of course, we know waste oil coming from engines. There might be molybdenum, lead in, uh, so we need to control this. And, and the truck driver needs an immediate answer. And so we, we are having a solution called PetroQuant. And uh, this is a trace element calibration. Uh, it, it's uh, already coming with the instrument. And here we have typically uh, lower detection limits below 1 ppm. So we are talking about 0 0.2, 0 0.4%. Uh, here you see chromium, uh, you, you see cobalt, uh, nickel. And, and so this is uh, quite nice. We are covering the range up to a few uh, hundreds or thousand ppms. And uh, it's an out-of-box calibration for everything which are uh, containing mainly carbon and hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And so the therefore it's covering wood, it's covering polymers, it's covering uh, oil. All those materials can be analyzed with, with petroquant. Yeah, so your typical alternative fuels that you're talking, there you can cover here. And like I said, this is, so this list was not even complete. Here's, here's another part of the list. So we can really go down to the low trace element levels here also for zinc. We mentioned it yeah. as, as a part for, for coming from the tires, mm -hmm. and we really uh, nail it down to the very low limit yeah. here. Yeah. So, so actually, you, you, you can go ahead and, and, and get uh, uh, vital uh, elements like chlorine, which would have a negative impact on the, the furnace. But also, you can do the more advanced tasks like the, the cadmium or the lead uh, pretty easily. And, and this really is an excellent tool, and we see this in Europe uh, pretty often, and also now uh, coming to other regions where uh, suddenly alternative fuels are becoming an issue. So as a bit of the last segment here, uh, Kai, I think we should talk a bit more about the final cement. So what, what can we do, what can we offer also in the part of once the cement is milled, when we get to the storage, and also later on uh, to the customer. So here, the obvious choice uh, of uh, solution is often cement quant. So this is really a versatile uh, uh, XRF solution designed for the cement industry. Um, it provides the workflow which meets the uh, good laboratory practices and includes check samples, samples as needed and even predefined uh, applications, not only starting from the raw material, uh, the raw mix to the clinker to the cement and more, and the nice thing here is also we covered different instruments, but this is really also available with all our key instruments here, so the Puma to the Tiger to the Lion. Mm -hmm. Maybe, Kai, you can briefly explain how we make, uh, with such a calibration, um, our uh, lab traceable to NIST. Yeah, so uh, the, the first thing uh, what we need to understand uh, uh, when we have a an, an certified reference material this is uh, processed uh, very fine. So from the uh, grain size and uh, the, the mineral composition, it might be different than uh, the real cement samples. So the method to address this is basically prepare a few speeds. And, and uh, so this means we have a flux like lithium borate salts. We are fusing the sample and dilute the sample and basically we form a homogeneous glass bead. And so this is basically analyzed on the instrument and uh, uh, the measurements are taken to create the calibration curve. Mm -hmm. The good thing is we are getting rid of uh, mineralogical effects. We are uh, uh, homogenizing 
the, the, the sample uh, uh, appearance. And um, so now we can run the uh, uh, CRM uh, and, and, and test the calibration. So we have validated our method and make it traceable to ASTM or to, to the BCR. And now we take basically uh, uh, materials from the factory uh, covering the interesting concentration range, prepare them as pressed uh, uh, fuse speed, and run them on the uh, calibration created by fuse speed. So now we have values for each particular sample which can be traced to an NIST or BCR uh, CRM. We take now a second aliquot from the sample and prepare as pressed powder and use this as a standard to create a, a pressed powder calibration. And here we have the advantage we are using the same sample preparation equipment, the same mill, the same press and the same additive like uh, we use later on in the process. So basically we have now created a pressed powder calibration which is traceable to NIST. And the entire procedure is set up already when purchasing the cement quant. And also the workflows are, are there. So uh, uh, including recipes for, for uh, optimal sample preparation. And so this makes the startup of uh, the, the routine analysis and being comparable to external labs a pretty easy job. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. thank you, Kai. So. Um... As Kai mentioned, at some point you get to the press pellet preparation, and this is because you need speed. So as a last example, I also want to highlight here a little bit the S6 Jaguar. Of course, in many cases, you would go to, um, to the S8 uh, Tiger for, for your production and process control. But the S6 Jaguar really allows you, also with the benchtop equipment, to get uh, a, a performance that is really similar to, to a floor standing system, just maybe taking a bit more time. And how we can achieve this? Well, this is basically because we really have gone into depth and redesigned um, the goniometer, made it really high precise and compact. And we also have an excitation possibility where we really can, can go to high currents, for instance, so to excite even the light elements with optimal settings. And one other feature that is listed here that's important to mention is that we are using the Hisense XE detector, which really allows us for um, to get up to 2 million counts per second in a really linear range. So these are some examples, and this is why you essentially are able to achieve results like this um, on, a, on a white cement here. This is, of course, mm -hmm. a pressed pellet calibration now. Um, so this is something that, that you would, for instance, more run in, uh, uh, once, once everything is set up. Could be coming from mm -hmm. originally a cement mm -hmm. solution or externally. Uh, verified uh, your, your secondary standards. And here you can really see that we achieve an excellent precision and accuracy even with the benchtop equipment, often getting far below um, the 1% relative standard deviation and even for sodium, 2% for such a low concentration of just 1.5 weight percent is really good. Yeah, so here uh, all the experts already recognize that uh, this uh, 30 hours precision test basically is the test you would do for ASTM C114. And this is also to mention that all our instruments are easily achieving ASTM C114 performance, also the, the, the benchtop instruments. So that's without a doubt uh, making sure that the instruments are capable to work in a cement plant. So maybe as a last part of this, uh, this session, before we switch to the lab, I want to come back to something that I mentioned earlier, uh, which is really a, a highlight with, with Bruker. So we are, we are able to put our systems in a, in a cabinet like that. This is coming from Herzog, their, their Adline lab, and having this fully automated. So the sampling, et cetera, coming uh, with even a benchtop equipment. Um, so how does this work? You have the automatic sampling, you have a sample preparation tool from Herzog in this case, you have um, the sample transportation highlighted here, and then the, the X-ray equipment, the S6 Jaguar, the S2 Puma would take over, receive the sample from the back, flip it for the measurement position, analyze it within a couple minutes, and return it or put it to the waste, whatever uh, needs to be done, and you get the assay within minutes. So this is really a nice feature that is only available um, for benchtop equipment with Bruker. Of course, all of our large equipments 
are having this capability. And this is something that Renata will show us in a few seconds. So now it's time for you to Renata to highlight our uh, D8 and S8 in an automated environment. Over to you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Kai. I welcome you all to our today's webinar. So today we are here in our automation showroom. We have two systems here, the D8 Endeavor and the S8 Tiger, which are connected here with a conveyor belt to show you how our automated system works and to simulate how samples are transferred from one system to another. Later on, my colleague Rainer Schmidt will introduce the D8 Endeavor and will also talk about the XRD applications for cement customers. I would like to show you the SA Tiger today. So the SA Tiger is our big floor standing wavelength dispersive spectrometer. The system is available in different configurations. We have a one kilowatt system, a three and a four kilowatt system available. Of course, different crystals can be also configured, but I would, what I would like to show you now is how the loader looks like and how the loader is configured, and later on how a sample is transferred and loaded as an automated sample. So now I would like to show you the loader. What you see here is the loader area. The most important part is the measurement chamber. So the samples are loaded here and analyzed in the measurement chamber. The grabber will pick up the samples from the different positions and will load the sample here. What you can see here is the automation interface. So a conveyor belt is connected and a flipper will turn around the sample to this position that it's loaded by the grabber. Here we have a configuration with a dedicated automation area. So from this area the automation samples are loaded. So here we have the press pellets into this automation steel rings. But we also have the possibility to load different samples from these other positions. So here, for example, we can load some beads, which are used for our cement solution, cement quant, or geoquant basic. But of course, we can also load glass sample, pressed pellets, here in this case, if we talk about secondary fuels, which is also a very important topic for cement customer, I have prepared a fluff sample as a powder analyzed in a liquid cup, but also liquid samples can be analyzed here. Or here I prepared a press pellet of this fluff sample, which can be analyzed here. Such kind of samples are typically analyzed with our standardless software, Quant Express but also our PetroQuant solution, PetroQuant, can also be used for this kind of application and it's very suitable. This area can also be used to load such automatic steel rings. So the grabber is able to load high samples like this easy loader cups, but also this uh, smaller samples or smaller and high um, for the steel rings. Last but not least, I would like to show you how a sample is transferred from the, S, uh, a, uh, from the D8 Endeavor to the S8 Tiger. And therefore I have to close the lid. So now my colleague Hannes will start the measurement to show how the sample is transferred and picked up by the S8 Tiger and how the measurement is started. So Hannes, please start the measurement. So now we see the conveyor belt is moving. It can be used to transfer a sample from a sample preparation equipment or from one system to another, like here from the D8 to the S8 Tiger. The sample arrived now in two positions, is detected by the sensors, and the flipper will now turn around the sample, so the sample is ready into measurement position, and the grabber will, a grabber will pick up the sample and move to the sample chamber. Now the measurement is started and this will take a couple of minutes. So that's all I wanted to show you now with the S8 Tiger. So we will uh, see later again 
with the S2 Puma, and now Rainer Schmidt will introduce the D8 Endeavor, and we'll talk about the XED applications for cement. So thanks a lot. See you. Yeah, thank you very much, Renata, for giving the floor to me. My name is Rainer Schmidt, and I'm going to focus on X-ray diffraction. So if we compare the scan data of both methods, it might look pretty similar. However, we are doing two completely different tasks. With X-ray fluorescence, we are analyzing the chemical composition. With X-ray diffraction, we are analyzing the phases. And this is important because the physical properties of materials, they are governed by the phase composition rather than the elemental composition. And that's not only true for cement, that's true for all fields of material science. And if we compare both methods more into detail, so with x ray fluorescence, we are measuring the elements for which we are using characteristic peaks. We are measuring the intensity either by height or area. And we are using these intensities to set up calibrations. And for this, of course, we need standards, and such calibrations need to be maintained. XRD is analyzing the faces, and we can distinguish them because they, different faces do have different crystalline structures. And if you look at the diagram, these faces can, depending on the symmetry, can have lots of peaks. So what we are doing is we are measuring not only one peak, we are measuring the complete scan and we are doing a profile fitting technique. We are using the so-called Riedfeld method. And by definition, the Riedfeld method is a standardless method, so it does not require any calibration and therefore we also don't have to take care about any drift correction. So I would like to focus on a couple of topics. First, briefly, I would like to go into detail why we are using XRD. And if we look at the whole production chain in the cement plant, there are a couple of areas where X-ray diffraction can help. I just would like to focus on the cyclones, on clinker, and on the final cement. So why are we using X-ray diffraction? Why are we talking about this technique? Because we want to monitor and predict the properties, the physical properties of our material. Things like the setting behavior, strength development, and whatever other things. The physical properties, they are governed by the phase composition and, of course, by the available surface, so the fineness of our product. Knowing the real phase composition allows us not only to monitor, but also in the long run to predict the quality of our products and, of course, we want to use this information to improve our quality. And, of course, we want to establish a stable production. So we want to reduce the standard deviations of important parameters in order, for example, to go closer to some norms to save money. This is a simple example to show you um, the impact of the phase composition on the properties. So this is just a simple SEM1, which is consisting of clinker, of a setting retarder, and a filler like a limestone. Let's look at the different phases and their impact on the properties. So if you look at the clinker phases, we do have the calcium silicates, a light and b light. They are responsible for the strength development. We do have the interstitial phases, aluminate phase and the ferrite phase. Uh, mainly the aluminate phase, this is responsible for, for the setting behavior of our product. And then we do have a couple of minor phases, which are shown here. Let's go to the setting retarder. Depending on what you add, if it's natural gypsum or anhydride or even some artificial product, we need to consider three phases, gypsum, hemihydride, and anhydride, because they are carrying SO3. All these three phases do have a different solubility, which has an impact then on the setting of our cement. With chemical analysis, you only see SO3. You have no chance to understand 
where SO3 is, if it's in the calcium sulfates or even in the alkali sulfates. And for example, if you do have some dehydration in the cement mill from gypsum to hemihydride, this has an impact on your properties. And if you want to see this, you have only one chance, and this is X-ray refraction. Well, and finally, we have a filler, which typically does have some phases which do not contribute much to, to, any, um, to any properties. So, let's first start looking at the cyclones and see how XRD can help here. This is um, a Riedfeld plot of a typical um, hot meal sample where we have lots of different phases because we have um, the phases of the initial raw materials but also the first reaction products. And I would like to go just a few of these phases because there's valuable information which helps us to understand what's going on. So for example, if you see here, what is given here now here in blue, this is the intensity related to a light. And a light in the hot meal is quite some nice information because a light cannot be formed in the hot meal. The temperatures are too low. So the explanation for a light, and we frequently see this in hot meal, is a dust circulation. So dust from the kiln which is going in the cyclones. So a light in the clinker is a warning about dust cycles, so energy losses. Other information we get, so for example, this is the intensity related to calcium oxide. We see the reaction from calcite, so calcium carbonate, to calcium oxide, so the decarbonation. So we can directly calculate the degree of decarbonation just in a few minutes, just by X-ray diffraction. Or what you see here, this is the intensity related to sporides. So we see phases which are typically related to problems in the cyclones, like sporide and calcium limonide. And we also see what is illustrated here. This is sylvite, so potassium chlorine. We see where the alkalis and the chlorine are. So we can follow the alkalis and chlorine because we see sylvite and halide, so potassium and sodium chlorine. So to summarize, a analysis of the hot meal, which is just done in a few minutes, provides valuable information such as the degree of decarbonation, it provides information about dust circulations, it provides information about phases which are related to blockages, and we see sylvite and halide, which allows us to monitor the alkali volatilization and the condensation, which is also triggering the formation of phases like sporite. Next topic, let's look at the kiln, at the clinker. In contrast to the classical Bog method, which is just a calculation based on the chemistry, we do see the true phase composition, and we not only see A light, B light, and the illuminate phase, and so on, we also see all the different polymorphs, like the A light M1 and M3, like the different B light polymorphs, or C through A cubic and autorhombic. And all these phases do have a different reaction behavior. With XRD, we are able to see this. And not to forget, there is no other method which allows to analyze free lime accurate and fast like the Riedfeld analysis. Classical titration-based method cannot follow. They cannot compete. In this graphic, I would like to show you a comparison between classical Bogue analysis of C3S, here in blue. So C3S by Bogue, and in red here, the real phase composition. And I'm showing this because the classical way of thinking in this main industry was that even Bogue has some bias it can be used to follow the trends. This is simply not true. So we have here production data from a plant covering about 
uh, one month. And for example, what we see here at the beginning is, this is the picture like you expect also looking at the textbook, so an underestimating of A-Lite. But even the amount of the underestimation is changing. No? So Bok can even not follow the trend correctly. And in this particular case, we even had scenarios where suddenly Bok was pretty similar to the real phase composition, and we even had scenarios where Bok was much higher than the real phase composition. So just relying on Bok, you do not have any chance to follow the changes in your product. The only tool which is providing this information correctly is X-ray diffraction. And it's not only a light itself, it's also, like already mentioned, we see the A-light polymorphs. So these are other data from another plant where we are covering about one week, where we see the A-light sum and the A-light polymorphs. And we also have the amount of SO3 given in another scale. So just looking at the A-light sum, we would have the impression everything's stable and the same. If we have the possibility to look at the A-light polymorphs, we see that here suddenly a change in the ratio of both polymorphs. And this is also correlated to a change in SO3. And what we had in this plant, so we had a change of the A-light polymorphs because there was a change in the fuel composition, especially in the SO3 content. And that's well known that both polymorphs A-light M1 and M3, they are pretty much related to magnesium oxide and SO3. So there's lots of valuable information uh, which XRD can provide to understand your product. And finally, let's look at cement. So we already discussed this. So we can differentiate the SO3 carrier. So we can see where the SO3 is, if it's in the calcium sulfates or even in the alkali sulfates. This helps us to understand what's going on regarding the setting of our product. But there's something else we can see. We can see some phases which are related to early and prehydration. And the usual phase we have here is syngenite. There are some others like atringite and so on, but this is uh, the usual phase which is related to that. And early hydration may occur in the cement mill, in particular when we have a vertical roller mill in the silo. This can lead to lump formation, but also to problems with the setting. And the usual phase we have to consider here, this is syngenite. And where is syngenite in a diagram? So this is um, a Rietfeld calculation of a, a pretty basic cement. So syngenite is here in the low angle range. And if you want to detect such information, you need a certain data quality, like you see it here. So a low background, but also um, a stable background, even going down to low angles. And that's where we are differentiating from other solutions. We take care about the data quality the overall background, but also the background at low angles. And we are doing this by two devices. One is the energy dispersive detector, the Linksi XCT, which is suppressing iron fluorescence, and also white beam residues, no? leading to an overall background. And we have another device, which we call the motorized air scatter screen, which is a knife above the sample, which is moving during the measurement, and it's always moving to the um, optimum position. And this is helping us to get an extremely flat and low background, even at low angles, which not only allows us to go down to lower angles to catch syngenite, but also to catch clays, which are getting more and more popular um, in the cement industry. So thank you very much for your attention, and I hand over to my colleagues. Thank you, Rainer, for showing the capability of our XRD systems. Now I would like to show you some more XRF. Uh, we do have some tabletop systems available. We have a tabletop wavelength dispersive system, the S6 Jaguar, but here we have an energy dispersive system, the S2 Puma. 
The system is available with different configurations. Here we have a system with the integrated touchscreen. From the touchscreen, it's very easy to start routine measurements. Um, the use is very easy, so there is not a big training necessary to operate the touchscreen. Of course, you can use uh, the external PC to start measurements, but typically it's more used to calibrate methods or maybe to evaluate some samples in case something is maybe a little bit strange or you would like to compare some spectra. The system is also available with different loader configurations and we also do have a light element version in case low sodium is important to be analyzed. Of course, the S2 Puma can be used as a backup in a cement uh, company, but also smaller companies can use it for routine analysis or maybe in some smaller limestone mines the system can be operated. Now I would like to show you a little bit more the loader, like uh, for the SH Tiger. So you see the concept is quite similar, like with the SH Tiger. We have the loader area here. So this system is uh, uh, equipped with an XY auto changer. So this means we have 20 sample positions available, plus two sample positions in the back, which is used to position quality check samples and uh, system check samples. The same cups are used, like for the SA Tiger, and of course the same samples can be analyzed. So, like here, beads for our solution, cement quant, and geoquant basic, which is also available for the S2 Puma. Liquid or powder samples can be analyzed using these liquid cups. And of course, pressed pellets can also, or solid samples in general, can be analyzed in the same cups. Here, we see again the pressed pellet in the uh, automatic steel rings. So also here, the grabber is able to handle both sample types. In the back, we have the connection to the automation interface. So here, the system can be connected in the same way, like the S8 Tiger, we use the same software, and IXS.com is also operated in the same way, like for the big systems. So let's close the lid. So here the S2 Puma is also a very capable system to be used in the cement industry. And of course, uh, we do have the possibility to integrate it in the same way to the automation like already shown. That's all from my side. Thanks a lot and let's go back to the studio. Yeah, Renata, thank you very much for this live from the lab session. And also thank you to the other speakers of today's seminar. Within this seminar, we provided an overview about the Buka solutions for the cement industry, showing in detail the WDXF system, the SA Tiger Series 2, which provides the most advanced XRF solution for the cement industry. For the XRD, we highlighted the D8 Endeavor, which provides optimal solutions for quantitative phase analysis. And as an overview about our product portfolio, we have shown you the benchtop XRF and XRD solutions, which included the S6 Jaguar, the S2 Puma, and the D2 Phaser. And with this, I would like already to switch over to our Q&A session and hope of a number of questions within the seminar. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for all the incoming questions we received so far. Um, quite a number of them were coming in during the registration to the seminar, but also in the Q&A tab of this session. Um, a number of them are related to alternative fuels, so um, that seems to be a really big topic um, uh, for the participants. Uh, one question is related to XRF. Is it possible to check alternative fuels and raw materials, so-called AFRs, such as solids, fluffy or oils with XRF, how to calibrate the system, and what about pet coke and especially SO3, and why not use ICP instead? Yeah, I, I guess I pick uh, the question, and uh, basically alternative fuels are pretty common, and uh, IC, uh, ICP would require an, an acid digestion with hazardous chemicals and a lengthy procedure. 
XRF can analyze those materials directly. So when we think about solids, they can be filled in a liquid cup, like fluffy material, a little bit compacted. Um, nevertheless, we also can uh, use liquid uh, cells uh, and, and liquid waste can go directly in. Um, some waste like, like uh, rubber, when we think about tires, there we can use also a cryogenic mill in order to, uh, to, to put the or to transform the plastics into a fine powder and actually compact this as a pressed powder pellet. So those sample preparations are mechanically and pretty quick. And we can use, for example, uh, PetroQuant, um, uh, that's a calibration for Bruker XRF equipment for trace calibrations uh, or containing trace calibrations with lead, cadmium, and other uh, toxic elements. And uh, of course, last but not least, also the chlorine and sulfur, is, uh, they are calibrated up to 1,000 uh, 5,000 ppm, so, so that's not a problem uh, to analyze by XRF. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and there are often also other new, newly materials used, such as ashes, ashes and serration residue, slags. Um, uh, how about that? And how about tires? How do you prepare them? Yeah, tires, on the one hand, I, I said uh, you can use a cryogenic mill. So basically, avoid the smearing effect in the mill uh, with, with uh, an, an, uh, freezing uh, those materials to make them brittle. So, and then they can normally be pressed. Uh, also tires, you can stamp out a round uh, circuit and analyze this directly. And you will get a pretty good feeling about the chlorine content uh, in the tire material. So for ashes and slags, we would recommend to use uh, the few speed preparation. And then you can use, for example, GeoQuant uh, Basic or GeoQuant Advance uh, calibration to get the accurate values for, for sulfur, chlorine, and other elements in there. Yeah. Um, are there different requirements for XRD sample preparation? And um, how about the maximum particle size? Is there any limit or what's there uh, to consider? Yeah, so both methods, X-ray fluorescence and X-ray diffraction, they do have different requirements regarding sample preparation. While for XRF, in order to minimize mineralogical effects, we want to have a very fine powder. For XRD, it is important that we do not destroy the crystals. However, in many automated laboratories, sample preparation is the bottleneck. Um, and then, of course, the question arises, is there a possibility to find a compromise? And this depends on the available um, sample preparation equipment. So for some materials, it is possible. Of course, this requires a couple of tests. Um, for some materials, not. So this depends on the local situation um, and needs to be checked. Quite a number of um, questions are related to the calibration on an XRF instrument. So how about um, this, especially for the cement analysis? What type of standards do you use? How you validate such system? How often do you have to run and recalibration? This seems to be a topic to be answered. Yeah, so first of all, uh, you can start easily by uh, using NIST certified reference materials or BCR reference materials. There you get a certificate and um, prepare those uh, uh, samples as few speed. And then basically you can take from your plant uh, process samples and uh, prepare them, a part of it, uh, prepare as few speeds and then measure against the NIST calibration. And then uh, you will receive uh, or you have validated your factory samples as secondary standards. And then you can use the second part of those standards and uh, prepare pressed powders and uh, use the validated results as the, the, the reference values for the calibration. And so therefore you are on the one hand uh, are using material or plant specific material and your sample preparation equipment. On the other hand, you are traceable to NIST or certified standards. So you are also producing comparable results. This sounds a little bit difficult, uh, you need to uh, acquire those standards, but that's not a problem when talking to us. We have a package called CementQuant, which already implement 
this kind of procedure. It's also that you typically only require to do a first time calibration when you set up the instrument. And then basically we won't recommend to run a conditional drift correction. So uh, our instruments can automatically run every morning a QC samples and check the limit values. And as long as the limit values are okay, uh, you can continue. In the moment you have small deviations, we would run the, the, the drift correction and basically correct for that. So therefore you can run or let the instruments run in an unintended mode. Nevertheless, it's always made sure that the calibration is okay. Thank you, Kai. Um, there was another question related to XRD. How about um, clays and calcium clays? Can that be analyzed? Yes, so this is a hot topic which um, came up in the last few years, um, mainly in order to, yeah, to minimize the carbon dioxide footprint. Um, we have been following and, and supporting all these activities over the last years with um, all the important players in the field. So we meanwhile do have the expertise uh, and the methods available for analyzing uh, the clay, so to do the quality control of, of the materials itself, but also to follow the calcination process. Um, so this is available. Um, um, again, um, this is part um, of, of the setup we do um, in the plants, and depending on the local requirements, we support the customer in order to optimize it for their purposes. Thank you. A number of questions are related to the environmental monitoring of heavy metals such as lead or mercury, thallium. How accurate and reliable are such measurements and uh, how about the availability of such standards? Yeah, um, those elements are pretty easy to, to analyze with a sequential instrument like our SA Tiger. So uh, the, the resolution is good enough. Uh, we have up to four kilowatt excitation power. And uh, so basically uh, we, we are analyzing those elements uh, down to the sub PPM level. So when we think about uh, lead sulfate uh, in, uh, in limestone, or when we think about the impact of tires or uh, the, the, the cadmium in, in zinc related materials or, or thallium in, in, in rocks. These are elements uh, which can be analyzed by our trace calibration solution. And uh, there we, we took international certified reference materials and have a calibration ready for this uh, purpose. For alternative fuels, as said, we can offer the petroquant solution, which are also based on hydrocarbon-based certified reference materials. Thank you, Kai. Um, can amorph amorphous materials like slags being measured by XRD? Yes, um, so amorphous materials um, can also, like, like crystalline phases, can be measured. So for most of the important materials like slags or coal flashes, we do have um, available and ready models um, to do so. Uh, for other materials, like for example, amorphous phases, which are part of puzzolans, um, this in most cases requires an individual uh, setup, um, which we are doing as the support work for our customers. So to answer the question, yes, um, amorphous phases um, can be analyzed. Um, and for most of the typical things which are used in the cement industry, uh, we do have the models ready. Yeah. So basically customers can get uh, the, the total information about the phases, but also with XOF about the element concentration. When we think about slags, we can analyze also the fluorine, which is typically uh, quite important. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, can the XOF calculate clinker C3S after inputting the free lime? Means actually, there, there are some bow calculations uh, available on the market where you can take element concentrations and, and have some uh, equations simply to calculate. Uh, nevertheless, since we, we are doing modern cement uh, plant works, we would always recommend to combine XOF and XRD because this gives you the accurate information. Otherwise, you would into a run into the risk that you optimize your process and, and based on, on wrong data, because the calculation, the math is not always valid, especially 
when you start to using alternative uh, materials. Exactly, definitely. So that's what I really can, can emphasize. So nowadays there is no need um, to follow any bulk values um, anymore because this is definitely an outdated technique. There was another XRF question. What kind of binder did you use to get pellets for XRF? I mean, so there, 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 there are different uh, binders available. So, so um, traditionally it's, it's wax. Uh, then uh, sometimes we use uh, boric acid. Uh, um, nowadays uh, the, the cellulose-based uh, binders has been established and, and those binders are uh, working pretty nicely on a lot of uh, materials and also can be adapted to automated press and mills. So uh, this would be my recommendation. Perfect. Um, another question about the energy dispersive instrumentation. Light elements are often tricky to be measured there with such an instrument. How about sodium and magnesium? Is that possible to measure um, these elements on the S2 Puma as seen um, in the presentation? Actually, in, uh, the, the S2 Puma also delivers ASTM C114 performance with the Hisense LE detector, uh, also including sodium and magnesium. So that's, uh, that's not, a, not, a, not a problem at all. So we can see, say clearly, it's a yes. And there was another question related to the Benchtop uh, WDXF instrument, the S6 Jaguar. What's the power of the system? So actually the S6 Jaguar sits in between the energy dispersive Benchtop systems and the floor standing units. So the S2 Puma starts with 50 watt direct excitation, the Jaguar goes to 400 watt excitation, and then the floor standing models as a Tiger, they range from 1, 3 to 4 kilowatt. And then the Lion, this uh, simultaneous instrument, works with 3 or 4 kilowatt. And this unit, as said, is uh, utilized for, for cement works with 2 or even more kilns. We have time for one very short question. Um, how, Rainer, um, how can you help us in running high sulfur coal in kiln? What is to consider there? Well, SO3 has an important impact. Um, on the face formation, um, and uh, yeah, this of course is in relation to um, to other elements like the alkali. So it has a big impact uh, on the C3A phase. So whether you get C3A cubic or autorhombic, um, but it also has a big impact on the formation of the elite polymers. So uh, with XRD, you definitely see um, the influence, um, and it will help you to. Um, yeah, to bring um, your product or the philosophy of your product in the direction you would like to have. Okay, thank you very much to, for answering the questions. There are a no, number of more, and, um, but we do not have enough time to answer all of them, but we will follow up with them um, as we have received them. So thank you very much for um, your time and um, being so uh, actively involved in the questions here, and then I'd like to hand over to Rainer and Kai. Yeah, also from my side, um, yeah, many thanks for uh, participation. And um, the last thing for this year is uh, to wish you a festive season. Outside in Karlsruhe, and, uh, today we have actually snow, so winter season is on here in Germany. And uh, once we survive the snowy condition and the festive uh, holidays, we will see you and hear from you next year with another set of webinars. Yeah, thank you very much from my side. So thank you very much for joining um, and hope to see you soon. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>